well as I like I would I would like to request everybody to rename themselves and put their class uh after their name. As well as uh, I welcome you all to the debate boot camp on making the complexities of international relations simple. Let me introduce uh just give me a second yeah. Let me introduce to our speaker, introducing our distinguished debater and speaker for today's workshop, Ruman, the renowned team UAE WSDC coach with an impressive tra track record, including being a Madrid WDC's 2023 Open finalist, being a mud uh, a, and a second best speaker, a Cambridge for 2023 Open finalist, and our speaker brings a wealth of experience and expertise to guide us through the intricacies of debating. As if it's, that's not enough, they have also served as the Black Sea 2023 EUDC convener, showcasing their leadership and organizational skills in the debating community. Let's welcome our esteemed speaker for an insightful and enriching session. Over to you, Rumin, sir. Uh, great, happy to have to, uh, thank you for having me. Happy to do this lecture. Uh, first, let me share my slides to make sure that's up. Uh, are you guys able to see uh, this? Yes? Okay, cool. Uh, give me a second. Okay, uh, welcome to the workshop on the topic of international relations. So I would like to start firstly with a disclaimer. I do not have any uh, degree or like professional experience in this field. I have only debated these motions probably tens, maybe 100 plus times uh, in my lifetime as a debater. So I'll be speaking from the perspective of the knowledge that I have accumulated and uh, like in general, how you're supposed to approach these types of motions. But uh, if you really want to uh, like get into deep information or ask questions about certain facts uh, and historical timelines and things like that, I'm not sure if I'd be the best person to answer that, but I can give you good resources that you can also read up about. Okay, cool. So um, let's start it off then. The first and most basic thing that you need to understand is that these motions that are IR motions are the same as any other motions. We're still doing debating. We're still analyzing incentives of actors. We're still analyzing the capa the ability or the capacity of actors to do X thing. Uh, and we're looking at the plausibility or the likelihood of said actions. So if I were to give you a motion about, let's say, uh, Let's say take the, the most basic motion ever given, which is uh, this house would uh, in, uh, uh, impose the death penalty, uh, right? Like uh, it's the standard argument, which is if we impose the death penalty, this will deter criminals from uh, doing violent crimes, you know, because they're now afraid of the uh, punishment. We're analyzing their incentives and their ability and the likelihood of their actions. Similarly here, we're just analyzing again the likelihood of actions of countries or uh, blocks of countries, you know, when they have uh, different unions, let's say the uh, European Union is one example, let's say NATO is another example, uh, let's say ASEAN is a third example, or just individual countries, like let's say uh, India, China, United States, or uh, maybe smaller countries like say Romania, Serbia, uh, something uh, something like that. So just, it, it's the same thing, it's just on a, a bit of a larger scale, so this shouldn't like stress you out or something like that, you should still look at it as normal debating. Uh, that you're analyzing the incentives and the capacity and the likelihood of the actions. It's just the scale is a bit bigger. So uh, I have outlined five broad incentives that you can uh, think think about when you're approaching these types of motions. However, before that, I'd like to take a step back, so to speak, and uh, I want you all to engage in a thought experiment with me. So the thought experiment is we are traveling on a plane and... Uh, our plane, for some reason, crashes on this, this random island. Well, it may not be this particular island, but it could be any other island. And all of us survive this plane crash. Um, and the question is, what will happen? What's the most likely version of events that will happen? Most likely, we'll, all of us will try to survive, like, collectively uh, together, right? We'll try to find resources. We'll try to... Uh, depending on how long we're there, let's say for the point of this experiment, we're there for a long time. We we don't know if anyone will save us. Uh, we are we have to you know start doing things like farming, fishing, hunting, uh, and we basically have to form civilization, right? Uh, then what happens is we run into problems. Maybe we don't catch that many fish. Maybe the we're not that particularly good at farming. Uh, maybe uh, we, for example, don't have the tools to 
uh, do something more complex, like let's say uh, build a more complex infrastructure, things like that. So what we are we have as an issue is we have uh, remember these words limited resources, right? We we have limited resources and rem limited capacity because we are on this island and uh, like we can't just randomly do all of the things like uh, farm all of the all, all, all of the land, like uh, catch all the fish and do things like that. So what happens then? Well, what happens is we have to find create a system of governance, right? We need to create some kind of way of uh, uh, redistribution of these types of resources, some kind of leadership structure, because you know human beings are social creatures. They need to to do this type of things, and we are on an, a random island. There, there are no countries, no law, no nothing. So here's what most likely will happen: a certain group of people will have one idea of operating, right? Let's say they would have the idea of uh, forming a democracy. You know them collectively voting on issues and uh, forming a certain behavior. Another group of people may f follow a autocrat, someone who, uh, for example, is a strong leader and says, if you if you want to be follow me, uh, you have to um, you you have to give up your rights, uh, but I will promise you security, I will promise you all of these things. And then what what's end up happening is the island is one. There isn't like a lot of space within this island. So inevitably these two groups of people will clash, right? Because the limited the problems of limited resources formed the creation of these types of systems. And these types of systems have diametrically opposed ideologies. One is a democracy, the other is an autocratic state. And so inevitably, one group of people would want more of the island, more of the limited resources. It could be, for example, a good fishing spot. It could be, for example, uh, let's say a, part, a section of the forest with good lumber for trees and things like that. Inevitably, this means that we would uh, go into conflict. Now, there are a couple of options here. We could start uh, harming each other, waging war against each other. We could uh, maybe have some skirmishes here and there, some kind of fights. Or we could just sit on the negotiating table and find some kind of middle ground. But the issue, the number one issue and the starting point of, the, of these problems and, uh, you know, the different scenarios is that we inherently have the problem of limited resources, limited capacity, limited time, which forces us to collectivize, and then it pits groups of people against each other. This process was how originally human beings came, like, came about, you know, like thousands of years before. And the idea of this thought experiment is if we were to do it right now, like put us in these types of circumstances, most likely this will be the same uh, situations that we will arrive again. It's just kind of human nature. Um, so here's the issue. Now imagine this way that uh, there are no more human beings left alive and the people from this island, like millennia and centuries pass, uh, colonize the planet and they form uh, like uh, countries and they form unions and things like that. And But still the original two groups of people are like very wary of each other. They, uh, they're like, uh, don't necessarily have the best history between each other. And they're basically in this uh, constant situation where they're viewing the other uh, side as your enemy or maybe not enemy, but at least your rival. And everything starts from here. This is like the global picture or the big picture of how countries operate with, within that you, you need to understand, right? We're going to talk about other incentives just in a second, but this is the primary incentive. It's that we have our group of people this group of people is uh we have we all special obligation to them us as a state we have to defend their uh defend them against other groups of people and other states and things like that um this is the core fundamental incentive of all countries and all around this planet uh there are other incentives but they tie to this big picture and you'll see in a second so what are the incentives of countries like let's break them down and all of these incentives tie down to the first original incentive that we talked about so the first incentive that uh, countries uh, like have is to stay in power, right? This is the the number one thing that any uh, any person uh, like any leader of a country wants. Um, if it's a democracy, you want to be in power. You want to be reelected the next election. You want to stay in power. If it's a dictatorship, you want to make sure that there is no like revolt of people to uh, take down your regime, uh, and uh, that way you want to be uh, or coup, and that way for you to to stay in power. So basically, what they do countries is that they owe a minimum services that they're providing to their uh to their people they provide them with security they provide them with uh you know in terms of like the military the police they provide with them uh in terms of like uh economic benefits they provide to them uh many things so 
what what how does this so this is a standard political analysis right like how states govern how does this influence uh ir there is this concept of national sovereignty i.e the way that a country uh is bordered on a on a map is like the legal parameters of that said country and their obligations towards uh towards their people so to put, put it in simple terms your country the territory within it that's your like that's your ownership towards the population there and you have to give it to uh you have to basically give the benefits from that towards your local population it can't go to another country because that's not your population that's another group of people that has another system of uh governments and another uh, another set of incentives so basically that's why both to the politician and to the people it's very important to keep the overall territory and integrity of of the country because otherwise you know you're losing land you're losing resources you're losing all of these uh type of things and that's how it the whole argument about them staying in power uh works in terms of uh sovereignty countries also care about economic empowerment uh this is because you know this could be many things this could be money this could be natural resources this could be trade deals uh this could be supply chains these are many things why do they care about uh uh, economic empowerment because everything that the country does requires money, right? You need taxable revenue. So like, you know, there is there is business, the government taxes it. And then uh, once the government taxes it, they have a budget and they can use this money for other things. So they have a vested interest to continue uh, economic empowerment. And that also kind of ties in with the first incentive because if your people are, your population is economically well off, then that means that they are likely to keep you in power. Um, the third thing we discussed is territorial sovereignty um, that I kind of touched upon, which is, you know, like keeping your country together, keeping it stable, keeping outside uh, forces and outside uh, influence away from it. It could be literal, like your country being invaded. It could be simple things like, for example, an outside country hacking your relations or influencing it th that way. Um, and yeah, th that's also kind of uh, correlates with the fourth thing, which is keeping uh secure like keeping security at play so you don't you don't want to uh, you want to have protection against enemy states terrorists criminal organizations uh these are i think the large sets of ones that could inherently damage your your people uh, either through warfare or through uh i don't know terrorist attacks or things things like that and finally some countries are ideological right like uh that's definitely not all countries but some are so for example the ussr uh, the Soviet Union was an ideological entity. You could argue that, for example, the United States or the collective West has a certain ideo ideology as well in terms of uh, neoliberalism, capitalism, and things, like, and things like that. Not all countries have that strong of an incentive in terms of ideology, but some do. And it is important to note that in their incentives. So what, what's the point of all this? What's the, what's the point of all of these so like uh, reasons? Whenever you get a motion uh, about IR, you should remember that the way countries think and the way countries operate is within the ma the matrix that's right in front of us. It's within uh, them staying in power. It's within them having economic empowerment. It's within them having territorial sovereignty. It's within them having security and certain ideological aspects. These are the more or less all of the incentives that a country may have. The original incentive is, you know, like to have as much resources as possible in order to benefit like my tribe. And just like after, you know, millennia have passed and we have gotten into this situation uh, where there, you know, there are multiple countries and multiple states, these are more or less the things that we talk about. In reality, these things that we have outlined are the thing, are the thing that we outlined in the example before. But this is just a way for you to find other different angles of analyzing and other different angles of explaining uh, things. So practically, how does this look like? If we have a motion, uh, let's say... Um, I don't know, like this house uh, believes that the United States should intervene in Haiti, right? Like, uh, I'm not sure if you guys are following the news, but this is, uh, but currently uh, Haiti has huge problems with uh, gang warfare and things like that. The country is basically not, uh, not functioning and we, we need, and we are government and we need to explain why the United States has uh, good incentives in terms of intervening, i.e. Why, why they'll do a good job. We could look at each of these incentives and outline why they'll do a good job when they're operating this way. So, for example, uh, since the, the Democrats or Biden have an incentive to stay in power, they most likely make sure that this intervention is uh, 
uh, is, at, uh, is as effective and as uh, non-problematic as possible because if it is not, if it ends up in a, in problems in a skirmish, they will be voted out of elections, uh, for example, because they want economic empowerment. They want to uh, make sure that all of the trade routes uh, via Haiti are uh, stable so that they can continue growing their uh, economy. So that's why they'll most likely want to do it in a good way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are ways that you can analyze it um, uh, for this particular way. Okay, so this is like the big picture of things. Uh, does anyone have any questions so far? Yep, you can. You guys can just unmute yourself and ask. Okay, what defines a nation? You were talking about common incentives of countries, but what exactly defines a nation? And you know, a nation is a nation. So, so here's the thing. Again, I, as I said, I'm not a, I'm not an expert in terms of like international law, sovereignty, and these particular things. Um, so I, I really, I really don't like feel uh, as if I'll give the the best answer uh, to this question. But overall, the idea is that if you have like a, a country, a group of people that have a, a collective identity, and uh, you know this collective identity um, is is a, is a certain way, and they are uh, like. Uh, what was the word for this? Uh, not ratified. They, uh, they're uh, acknowledged. What was the word for this? God, I forgot the word in English. Basically, other countries say that you are a country. You know, like, uh, so for example, um, there is this country in Europe called Kosovo that isn't recognized. That was the word. That isn't recognized by all of the countries, but it is recognized by a large degree of uh uh, of countries. And right now, it's, its status is kind of subjective, whether that's a country or not. So... Hard, hard to answer, hard to answer. But these are the general guidelines. Uh, I would note, like, you don't, re you won't really get that many motions about this house would grant statehood to X group of people or something like that, or they very rarely prop up. So it's more, it's better to look at like what are the general incentives of countries, things like that. Okay, uh, let's move. Yep. I Sorry. had, I had a follow up question to this. So in many times we see that we see that in large tent countries such as those which are democracies there are often lie various different peoples for example in africa there is a huge uh, uh, is a muslim and christian divide in countries so can we consider these such divides two different nations because that has been done in some historical places mm, it depends so mostly not so like uh the, the so you can't you can't you can't uh, categorize categorize religion itself as uh, a dividing factor of a nation because then if you have a religious minority in a, in a country they would be able to like make their own country and that would be very problematic you know in terms of uh, uh, what, what do we understand as a country and in terms of these things now that's not to say that this doesn't happen uh, there are actually many examples of for example autonomous regions around uh, around the planet where uh, a certain group of uh, a minority, let's say, that has a different uh, religion, decides to claim that they are a different, uh, like di they are a different state and things like that. So, on the top of my head, like uh, in uh, in uh, Bosnia, which is in in the Balkans, there is a Serb minority there. Like it's a it's a country comprised of Serbs, Croats, and Bosnians. Uh, so basically, Catholics, Muslims, and Orthodox Christians. Uh, and technically, there are three different countries, even though they kind of exist on the same route. So this is, in general, a complex issue and uh, would require us to go into that uh, very, very deeply. But the idea is there isn't like a very part. So here, here, here is the here's the truth. Like, here's the here's how it goes. What is written as a rule as to why something some a country is a country is not like the real reason why a country is a country. The real reason a country is a country is usually if that uh, country is able to defend itself from other uh, larger countries that try to take it or like to claim the territory there. There, So that's why, for example, certain territories that have rebelled become countries. Other territories that rebelled don't become countries. So it's kind of like whoever is able to defend themselves, similar to the example of the island, right? Because let's say if the, if the democratic tribe is like a small one compared to the autocratic tribe, then the autocratic tribe would simply come... Uh, and to use force to assimilate them towards themselves. So, yeah, something along those lines. But actually, this is something we'll cover later. So uh, let me go uh, on my presentation, and uh, I think I'll answer these uh, these questions more. And then I'll have another section for questions. Thank you, sir. No worries. Cool. Ah, 
hold on a second. I think my presentation uh, was, no, it is like this. Okay. So these are the common incentives of, of countries. So here are some misconceptions about uh, countries. And there is this very fun uh, like debate uh, lingo, which we like to say states are not little girls. Uh, basically, because uh, the, what debaters usually do in debates about countries, they go, ah, now Russia will be angry at you and they will invade your country or something like that. Or America will be angry at you, uh, and which is like the analogy to this is like uh, they are a teenage girl that uh, gets in a fight with you and uh, decides to do something like that. The, the point is countries are much more complex entities than uh, than this, like. A government is comprised of multiple people, and they are multi and they have security checks. Like for example, uh, technically the United States has, let's say, nuclear weapons. They won't you like the president himself can just shoot the nuclear weapons, right? He has to get uh, security uh, clearance based on the guy, uh, the other people who also have like the they call it the football. It's this little, uh, it's this little case there. So like that's an example. The other example is you can't just invade another country you need to get clearance from the parliament or the senate or something like that and also the people this is assuming that the world leader is a crazy person right in in general these people are not like that right they are like they have pragmatic incentives to do the things they do that's not to say that they don't for example start conflicts or don't uh, create uh, for example trade wars and things like that they do these things but they don't do it because uh uh, of uh, like emotions or irrationalities. They do it based on concrete pragmatic reasons, which we talked about in the beginning. So generally these like very shallow uh, types of analysis that are like, ah, like this this actor will now get angry and they'll decide not to, uh, not to uh, do X thing or to do X thing. It's just like, that's not, uh, that's not adequate. Like this is number two or number three as well. Their leaders are somewhat sensible and they have like other competing pragmatic incentives. So for example, uh, like if it is, oh, they, you'll get angry and you, you'll backlash, like that's not a real mechanism. But if, for example, they'll uh, receive a lot of benefit from, uh, let's say, acquiring a segment of the territory, which is something we'll talk about later, that's a pragmatic uh, incentive. Uh, another thing is like in these debates, uh, so, for example, the Russia-Ukraine war and things like that, uh, when people say they'll hate you, they'll never negotiate with you. This is like nonsense. They have pragmatic incentives to sit down and stop the war. Even if they hate you, you'll sit down, you'll negotiate. In some period of time afterwards, uh, conflicting states all the time do all the time do this. Uh, so, so, yeah. So this is like just my, I, I wanted to dispel this uh, whole concept of uh, like a, uh, we are we are simplifying the way countries think. They don't think this way. Cool. Uh, has anyone here played the game Fallout, uh, Fallout Four or Fallout Three? Okay. So basically, if you haven't, this is a very good game. I would advise everyone to play it. But basically, the uh, it's like this alternate history type of uh, game where, uh, like. Uh, uh, there is a nuclear uh, winter and things like that, but that's not really important. The important thing is like this saying, uh, war never changes, which is like the motto here. Uh, we are currently in this, uh, I think we're probably in the end of this like peace time uh, that, has, that has existed for a long period of time. Um, and in general, you should... When we look at the perspective of war and warfare between countries, or and when I say war, I don't mean like all out war. I mean, in general, violence between countries. Like this is the definition of this. You need to understand that countries look uh, at these two things uh, at two perspectives, peacetime and wartime, where peacetime is the period where you prepare uh, for, uh, for warfare down the line. The reason this is the case is when we go back, and this is how I'm trying to make the big picture, small picture thing for you guys. Uh, if we go back to the example of the of the island, it's just a matter of zero sum resources. What you have, uh, what you have, means that I don't have it, and vice versa. So it's important to control territories in order to have resources, in order to have trade routes, in order to be able to put uh, weapons there, in order to like basically scare your uh, neighbor more into giving you more and things like that. That's the unfortunate nature of things. Uh, it's just on a larger scale. So, yeah, and here I kind of started to 
uh, to to explain this particular thing. So I got ahead of myself. But basically, this is the num this is the number one uh, interest when you're looking when you as a country are looking at uh, like you know a warfare as an option. And some people say, okay, but like um, we have went past this period, right? Like it's not uh, it's not like this. Well, kind of not, right? If you look at the, the even the current day and age, there are plenty of wars that are happening around the planet. But also, if we do if we do another thought experiment. Let's say, like, tomorrow, there is no oil except for Alaska, right? Let's say this is the thought experiment. The only place where na the natural resource oil exists will be in Alaska. Then all of these countries that otherwise have, like, pragmatic incentives, you know, like, they don't want to do war and things like that, but their economies are super dependent on this resource, and now it's in the hands of the Americans who can just, like, raise the, the price of oil as they decide. Well, that's the, that's the moment where you, for example, consider violence and consider warfare in order to get what you uh, uh in order to get what you need in these particular uh in these particular moments so this is how the the and the, the reason i chose this thought experiment is that this at a certain moment will happen at a certain moment we will have like resource shortages at a certain moment we will have like uh, uh i don't know some some other event some other event that will happen on the planet which means that countries right now are preparing for like this ultimate moment of uh, like uh, warfare and things like that so they're likely to do things for example mini wars or small wars uh in order to prepare best for uh this particular moment down the line in order to for example secure uh supply routes for future wars uh positioning their weapon systems uh like resources that are in the territory and things like that so let's take an example of the ukraine war honestly the the main reason uh like they uh they invaded this the russians is because uh if they don't control these territories there that are the the zaporizhia and uh, like uh I, I forgot the other or the donetsk oblast and all of these four like uh, areas there is because that if you are able to put weapons there and control these territories from there towards moscow it's a it's an even plane it's very easy for you to like deploy soldiers and uh, be very very deep in the country uh, in the, in the country's capital and things like that. So let's say today you know the Western countries are very very peaceful, but you don't know in, if in twenty or thirty years they'll be as peaceful as they are now, uh, or they won't be willing to uh, do this particular warfare. So that's why it's important for you uh, to control these territories now, so that you can build up defenses there and you can. Uh, basically protect your soft underbelly that's how they they call it and things like that um so in reality it's all the same incentive right like it's all it's all the same thing that you you want to you know to protect yourself to have economic empowerment and things like that and but even if a, a certain idea seems like a bad one right now like russia got super sanctioned after that um they they got like um uh, uh, many of the people didn't want to trade or cooperate with them and things like that. You don't know that if in like uh, 10, 20 years or something like that, it would have been a net positive for them for doing this or if they would have been forced to uh, to do so otherwise. Cool. So then the question becomes, how how do we prove warfare in debates? You know, because sometimes you have these weird motions about uh, proving warfare and things and things like that. Now, before you start proving this, you should understand that this is a high burden argument, right? Like this is an an argument that actually, like, uh, you're you're trying to prove something that, in general, doesn't happen all that often. Not that this is impossible to, for you to prove it. It's just that the burden of this uh, of this uh, motion is very high, and you can utilize it only in specific motions. So. Like, don't uh, randomly uh, try to prove it in, uh, I don't know, a social movement's motion or something like that. But if there is truly a motion about international relations and warfare uh, as an argument could be on the table, then it's a good idea to uh, prove it. So here are like a couple of ways for you to prove it. The first and most basic thing is what you touched about is the natural resources. So are you guys following the Venezuela versus uh, Guyana? I hope I'm pronouncing this properly uh, in the news right now. Yes. The yep. Yeah. So the context is basically uh, in Guyana or Guyana, there is like this uh, territory called uh, Esequibo or something like that, where they found uh, a lot of oil. And uh, Venezuela in the past, uh, like uh, contested this territory as it is theirs, but then, sorry, you have to, can you mute yourself? Thanks. 
Uh, so basically, Venezuela in the past kind of contested this territory, but then forgot about it. Like in the past, I'm talking like the 50s, the 60s. Uh, and then recently when they realized that there's oil there, uh, and when we're talking about oil, we're talking about huge reserves of oil. So something like $300 uh, billion uh, of oil is there. Uh, they're now currently thinking of annexing the, the territory. So taking it as, uh, as their own. Uh, so like, here's a, a very clear moment where Yes, war is bad. You know, like, yes, you will uh, ultimately harm your economy. You'll, be, you'll get a lot of sanctions. Yes, you'll have, like, some of your own people dying. You know? Yes, there'll be, for example, uh, like, uh, damaged infrastructure and things like that. But if the benefit is literally su- su- supplying yourself of $350 billion of, uh, of, oil, of oil money, then it's something that you will take the, you will take the risk and you will take this chance uh, right now. Now, that's not to say that this will happen. But the probability of this happening is scarily high, right? Like it, it could, it would, it would be, it could happen tomorrow. So if you get, let's say, a motion about, the, I don't know, this house as the United States should intervene here, or this house as uh, I don't know, uh, Brazil should intervene here, or something like that, which is a possible motion to be given. Uh, when you actually explain these facts and explain how crucial this natural resource is to their economy, their development, and the future, then it doesn't seem like uh, that unlikely that this will happen. Uh, let's hope to God that it doesn't, but yeah. Uh, the second point, uh, way to prove it is like via flashpoints. So like, what's a, what's a flashpoint? A flashpoint is basically when you put two, uh, military assets very close to each other. So let's say two ships in a sea are very, very close to each other. And, uh, they, they could, because they don't know they're so close, they're wondering, well, the other guy attack me and they like may start firing, for example, warning shots against each other. And these warning shots then escalate to them starting shooting at each other and then bling, bringing one fleet against another fleet and things like that. So a good case study for this is the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, if you guys know nothing about this, I would advise you to like uh, watch it and uh, read up about it. But basically, the way it happened was uh, in the 60s, the United States placed uh, nuclear re- weapons in Turkey. Uh, and Turkey is like very, very close to the Soviet Union or Russia, uh, like later Russia. And so what uh, the USSR decided to do is they decided to put, put uh, nuclear weapons uh, near Cuba. Uh, Cuba is 150 kilometers away from, uh, I think, miles, sorry, 150 miles away from Florida. So like they, they literally placed these weapons very, very close to uh, the United States. And uh, they were there via nuclear submarines. So what the states, uh, when the Americans first like saw this, they were wondering, like, why is there a submarine here? They decided to drop some, uh, like they're called these like bombs, underwater bombs, I think mines. Uh, and they randomly dropped them in order to get them to come out. So in this moment, you have no idea what's going on. You have no idea if uh, they're shooting at you, if you should shoot back, uh, if you should deploy the weapon and things like that. And in these moments of confusion, you are very, very close to, to warfare. Now, ultimately, war didn't happen, but it was very, very close to happening uh, in, in, in these particular moments. So... This is how you prove, in general, all these motions about military escalation, where you put one army next to the other army when they're very close, and you get to these like flashpoint moments where one one side could start shooting at, at each other um, and things like that. Third possible way is like miss misfire. So there's a I, I I forgot the year when this happened, but basically during the war in Syria. Uh, where together, collectively, they were fighting their forces from the United States, Turkey, and uh, and Russia. Uh, by mistake, uh, Turkey, which is a NATO member, shot down a Russian jet. Um, and in general, this is like a, a trigger to start the Third World War, basically, because you shot down a, a Russian army plane. It's like super dangerous that this, uh, that this happened. Uh, and then they kind of like uh, negotiated some things. Uh, the Turks uh, bought some some of the some military technology from the Russians, and they came to an agreement, similar to the island example in the beginning. So everything was fine. But but uh, the fact that you by mistake shot shot down another military asset is a is a significant reason. And like the more wars happen, the more likely it is that situations like this could happen that could trigger uh, a, a greater conflict from happening. Uh, fourthly, when all other options run out, so like when you try to like negotiate with the party, when you try to like uh, give them things and things like that, and they end up uh, attacking you anyway, uh, that's a reason for you to done this uh, to do this particular thing. 
uh, when all other options have failed. Um, and finally, this is the crucial thing. Countries like to test each other all the time. So like when by testing, they mean you, you would, for example, do things like for fly a plane very, very close to the airspace or even within the airspace of another country. Uh, just to see what the other side will uh, will do. So this is something Greece and Turkey do all the time to each other. The Turks, they fly very closely their planes to Greek islands that they're claiming that those islands are theirs. Um, and what, ha what the Greeks do is they, uh, like they have these planes called Rafals that are able to lock in a missile hundreds of kilometers away from you. And uh, when this happens, the other guy like who is flying receives a notification that he is being locked in. Uh, so that way they're telling him don't pass any further. And so what that, what usually happens is like the plane goes back, you know, they've tested it. They see their capabilities. They see that they could attack them and that's fine. But what happens if, for example, I don't know, like, uh, the, the Raphael decides to shoot the missile or maybe the Turkish airplane continues to fly, uh, more and more within the, uh, within the zone and things like that. So ultimately this is how you prove war or escalation. There are multiple ways for you, for you to do this. Uh, again, you you can't do this in many motions, but on certain motions you can do it. And uh, the reason we 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 dedicated like so much of our time for this is a, a huge portion of the IR motions I've noticed are about a form of warfare or a form of conflict. So it's good to know. We'll also discuss some other things uh, later. So let's talk about something else for a second, which is other forms of warfare. So this so we we discussed like moments where uh, like. Um, we, we have two countries at odds to each other, but there are other ways that countries can uh, harm each other uh, via like warfare and things like that. So the first thing is sending terrorist proxies. So in Russia, when Russia annexed Crimea in 2014, uh, they sent these like little green men. That's what they call them. So they were basically Russian soldiers that uh, weren't associated with the Russian army, but were um, were were these like separatists that they planted there in this uh, uh, in this country that want to have their independent state and things like that that are in reality have like super close ties to uh, the Russian the Russian country uh, but you know like they are they give them they give the country basically plausible deniability that they're not doing this the Russians can deny that these little green men are their soldiers uh, this way then you have like uh, Hezbollah and Hamas. Uh, who are uh, terrorist organizations in the Middle East that are backed by uh, by Iran, as another example. And basically, you can send these actors within a country, and you can destabilize it a lot by basically um, by basically you not know, them doing uh, terrorist attacks, them maybe even in certain cases waging all-out warfare that are not the official armies of countries, but you can definitely see that they are very very close to that uh, country. The second thing is cyber warfare. So you can do things like, for example, hack hack elections to determine results. You can stop critical government or infrastructures, like let's say websites, hospitals, and things like that uh, to cause instability. And finally, uh, you have like uh, sanctions as a way. So you could stop trade with them. You can, in general, uh, lower, cold, the like freeze the relationship, let's say, with uh, another country by pulling back your uh, your uh, country representative in that country, your ambassador. Yeah, that was the word, ambassador. Um, and that way you generally signal that, um, you know, tensions between you and that country are, are increasing and things like that. So this is like when we look at country to country warfare, let's look at interventions for a second. So what are military interventions? Military interventions are usually when uh, a superpower or a collective of countries together decide to militarily intervene in a country where uh, huge atrocities are happening. These huge atrocities can range from genocide to a civil war uh, to, for example, in Haiti now, gangs taking over and, thing, and things like that. The issue with interventions is that always they are very, very um, messy, unfortunately. There's a lot of collateral damage uh, that happens. Uh, the soldiers don't necessarily have the best information, uh, and in certain cases, they may they themselves may fuel put more fuel, uh, more fuel in the fire. Uh, in this particular case, so here are like a bunch of historically very notable uh, interventions: the 1999 bombing of Serbia, the Gulf War uh, from 1990 to 91, the U.S.-led in invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq in 2003, a Russia intervention in Syria in 2015. 
uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. like you you get the picture uh if you guys want you i would advise you to like read up uh, about each of these but basically uh for all of these things were uh there is some kind of conflict some kind of civil war some kind of unrest that's happening and the international community or superpower decide to uh intervene usually the way that these motions work is you have to if you are pro intervention you have to prove that the intervention is better uh, than doing nothing and then the other side goes along the lines of well we can do some other things uh we can maybe do some sanctions and things like that but we do, but we think the intervention would cause more harms in general this is like a very debatable issue like if you catch someone on the street and you ask them okay what do you think about these things they'll have an opinion about it so it's it, it's a real debate whether or not interventions are a good thing or uh or, or or a bad thing i purposely didn't like go over all of these because you know some of the details are very very brutal but uh you can you can in general read up about it and know about these things cool uh let's then get out of the point of like military and let's look at more let's call them softer softer things uh so what is a sphere of influence a sphere of influence is a geographical territory that encompasses a bunch of countries that are under the influence of a single country, in most cases a superpower, uh, that they have a significant control over. So let's so the best example of this is you have the United States. All of Southern America is in their sphere of influence. Why? Because they're simply very close to uh they're very close to them. Um so what what why what is the important thing of a sphere of influence? A, a sphere of influence is important to a superpower because basically that's the let's call it external border of the country, right? It's not the real border of the country; it's the other uh, parts of the country. This is why the Americans got so mad for uh, because of the Cuban Missile Crisis because when you are able to put uh, nuclear weapons as the Soviet Union in Cuba, which is very very close to uh, to America. You're basically able to threaten them uh, on on their territory, you know, on their uh, on their on their terms, which in general increases the like all of the things that we talked about. It increases the likelihood of your people being harmed. It increases the likelihood of uh, uh, other other escalations and things like that. But also economically, you know, because when you have uh, a lot of trade with Southern America, you're using a lot of Southern American labor and things like that. Uh, and they are dependent on you. If another country, let's say China, comes in and uh, offers them, let's say, loans, offers them businesses, offers them trade, that necessarily harms your interests as well as a country because now there's competition on the block. Now they can make a better offer. And now you have to, for example, uh, lower the amount of offer that you are providing. So if they're giving them a loan, lower the interest rate. If you're giving them a trade deal, lower the conditions on the trade deal and things like that. Um, other examples of this are, for example, uh, Eastern Europe and the USSR after 1945, and currently China and Southeast Asia. What an important thing to note is that a sphere of influence is not static. That means that it's not something that once uh, set, it will remain uh, there forever. It changes over time. An example of this is that uh, currently the East Eastern Europe pivoted towards the West, so Many Eastern European countries joined NATO, joined the European Union after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So now we're in the sphere of the influence of the European Union and the Americans. Uh, another example of this uh, is, for example, uh, once the war in Ukraine happened and, you know, like uh, the Russian resources was stretched too thin, uh, there was a, a mini conflict between Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia about the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, region where as the Azeris basically went in and took that territory. Uh, the Russians were allegedly supposed to protect Armenia and give security guarantees in the region. They didn't do anything. Uh, and that meant that now uh, Armenia pivoted more again to the West and to France, and Azerbaijan pivoted to uh, Turkey as the other uh, local superpower. So these things change. And usually there are lots of motions about uh, you as a certain country pivoting towards one global superpower or another. So here you can, you know have to analyze the general incentives around whether it's a good thing to cooperate with democracies versus dictatorships, whether it's a good thing to cooperate with uh, a certain economy versus not, uh, and things like that. But also in terms of uh, when you're analyzing incentive of, let's say, uh, America, uh, Russia, or China, or these particular things, to them, these sphere of influences are almost like extensions of their body, right? Like th they view they view these things as as if you are encroaching on their territory 
almost almost the same so this is why basically the uh, the russians decided to invade ukraine because from their perspective they think that uh this ter- this is like their sphere of influence and it's not the americans and uh, uh and that's why they should necessarily control it uh in in this way um this is like why for example maybe china is also trying to increase its sphere of influence to other countries influence them and things like that then you might ask how does the influence happen and this is like the 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 core logic here is via like hard and soft things so hard things are like offering you a loan hard things are like offering you like to build a port for you and these type of things but softer things are also like collective negotiations so for example when two countries that are in your sphere of influence have a problem, like let's say Guyana and uh, Venezuela and things like that, they to come to you to resolve this problem. So the three of you sit down and negotiate and you're like, can we find a solution to this? Let's try to mediate the different things. Uh, And you know, you being able to influence them uh, by making them promises, by talking to them. This is what soft power is called. Like you are able to control different things without, you know, exerting, exerting power, just like your, negotiation power your uh the manifestation of uh, like uh the things that you can promise or the threats that you can make are the power that you uh that you have and things like that and uh yeah that's uh that's it in general um i'll stop sharing uh well no actually i won't share i won't stop sharing my screen because maybe i'll go to a slide uh before that uh does anyone have any questions yes uh, yeah, so I wanted to ask that uh, throughout your presentation, you have talked about the world being on the brink of war, and that does that idea does seem logical to me. But however, I think we are being portrayed two different pictures. On one hand, uh, we are told that war is inevitable and there are many conflicts throughout the world, whereas others say that finally UN is there, peace is be, uh, peace is being worked out, and finally we have passed the age of warfare and force. So, what will be the new world order? Will it revolve for, for the uh, for the next 15, 20 years? Will it revolve around warfare or will it continue to be one of peace? So, I I don't have a magic ball to tell you. Uh, you know, to to be able to uh, predict this particular thing. So there is this concept of mutually assured destruction, which is basically if, uh, let's say, uh, the, the Russians decide to shoot their nuclear weapons at the Americans, the Americans will shoot their nuclear weapons back. And uh, uh, this will mean that the planet uh, literally burns. Uh, and the, the damage is so great that no one will actually do it. Right? No one will actually uh, pull out the button and click it and shoot uh, one rocket against each other because at the end of the day, they have their own self-interest to retain, which means that you uh, like, um, which means that you are not incentivized to have warfare and rather you're incentivized to cooperate with each other. This was the narrative that existed in the 2000s, you know, when the Soviet Union was dispelled, when there was optimism, when people love these particular things. It doesn't seem to be this way now. It seems like we're kind of waking up from this dream, and uh, it seems that war is inherent to the to the human condition because, as we said, uh, resources you being uncertain of what your your the other guy will do, or you being afraid that one day it will may happen against you, which means that uh, you are likely to take uh, these actions. Another thing I would like to note to answer this is we don't know what kind of future technology exists. Maybe today nuclear weapons seem seem very scary and mutual assured destruction and things like that. Tomorrow, maybe a new type of weapon will exist, and this new type of weapon may totally change the uh, change the the way uh, people people leaders countries feel, uh, or maybe resources will be depleted and uh, people will be forced to do this. Uh, it's uncertain; nobody knows. Um, but I, I I would say it's more likely that conflicts will continue rather than uh, they won't. Uh, but in debating. Like right, like because uh, this is me in general answering in debating uh, for certain motions, it is pretty plausible to uh, explain these things. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, hope I'm pronouncing your uh, name properly, Kashish. Yep. Uh yeah. Hello, sir. Also, like I really liked um all of your slides, your content. It was really helpful understanding international relations. I also wanted to say that like the slide of states are not little girls. I feel like it's been used 
in the debates I've been in a lot where people are trying to like oversimplify the fact um, that leaders would do this for their personal gain, etc. But I had a question regarding to or uh, regarding to the slide of how to prove war or escalation. So like every time I brought up this argument in a debate and I like like bringing it bringing it up backed with a lot of evidence, um, like in a proper way, like the fact um like simply the principal argument of human rights and humanitarian how it'll be bad for the people that always somehow manages to outweigh um the point of war and escalations and why it can actually help. So any way to outweigh that um from the side yeah. of war. The answer is it depends on the motion. Because let's say uh if the motion is I don't know something about trade. You know, like we are limiting trade and you're trying to prove that this will lead to warfare. It's unlikely. So let's say you're you're running, uh, you're doing a debate like uh, this house as the USA would impose uh, sanctions on China, economic sanctions. Uh, and you're running the argument uh, on, oh, this will lead to a war. It's highly unlikely that this will lead to a war. Um like, because we, we know, we have the benefit of hindsight. The United States for years imposed uh, sanctions against China and that did not lead to war. Uh, so it's like to be this way. If you if the motion is like, this house is the USA should intervene uh, preemptively in uh, Venezuela and uh, Guyana, seems very likely to me that this will happen. So like, that's a place where you have a lot of burdens. But to mechanistically answer it, the burden is proving that within the incentive structures of the country, they're willing to trade off peace and uh, uh, and stability for something in return. So if that's something, this territorial gain, let's say, is likely to be big or high enough uh, and significant enough for them, then they could trade this off. Now, obviously, this doesn't mean that all judges will buy this idea. Maybe they won't. And it really depends on the motion, but it is not impossible to prove it for sure. So I would advise you to like continue trying and to think about uh, when you're analyzing these things to already compare it against the thing that the other side will say. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Great. Uh, Kaber? Yeah. Oh, uh, well. So what are your thoughts on the Security Council? Do you think that it's relevant to war and conflict? And or do you think that it's just a waste of time and that the veto powers are being used for the personal gain of countries and not really to bring peace? Uh so <laughs> probably the second thing, right? Uh because they for for example, if you look at the war in Gaza right now. So many times they're vetoing each other. Uh, it's kind of absurd. And they're not really doing it uh, to like, because they really, really believe in this stuff. They're just doing it to, because they're geopolitical rivals, just to oppose either the States or just to oppose either Russia. Um, and given that they have this, uh, this veto power, they can easily abuse it. Now that's not to say that nothing gets passed. Obviously some things get passed. So for example, the resolution for the intervention in Haiti got passed. It got passed very slowly, but it's there. Uh, so I guess there's a balance between the two things. Maybe the balance tilts more to abuse and personal gains of countries. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay. Uh, well, cool. I think we are close to time. Any final questions? Well, I hope this was helpful then, uh, and uh, everyone learned a bit of things. I, in particular, the framing in the beginning, like don't don't think about it so concretely. Think about it broadly, like broadly. These are the incentives of country. Broadly, countries think this way, and then like I'll go back to that slide. And then when we when we look at the specific incentives, they're broadly following these categories, right? So, hope this was helpful. Uh, yeah. I had, I think I have one final question. Uh, yep, I, sure. Somewhere I need further clarification on this. If we are ever in the debate on the side of war, how do we justify war? Uh, for example, if we, uh, if we say today that the US has to, suppose I'm the US and I want to interfere in 
Taliban in Afghanistan. We have to prove that it is good for humanitarian cause to go to Afghanistan. How do I justify war? Well, you have to. That's why most interventions are not to change regimes. Most interventions are when there are blatant uh, uh, human rights violations. So, for example, or illegal activities, illegal by international law. So, for example, the 19, uh, 1991 intervention in Iraq, uh, Operation Desert Storm, I think that's what it was called, was because uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait. So they did uh, an invasion in another country, and uh, then the intervention is justified because uh, a big country invaded a small country. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you very much. No worries. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, well, this was uh, uh, a pleasure, guys. I hope you guys uh, learned a lot. And yeah, um, do we just leave the, the Zoom? Well, if you have any other classes or things like that, you can go to them. If not, uh, nice seeing you. Bye. And best of luck at any future tournaments. Bye, sir. Thank you. Bye, Bye sir. Thank you, sir. Bye, sir. Thank you.